Hello, this is Scott again from Scott in the System, and I believe this is episode number six, uh, our last one for this season before I go into winter hibernation. Um, our guest today is Bob Calry, the original regional coordinator for Michigan Medicare Medicaid Assistance Program. Thank you for coming. Absolutely, Scott. Happy to be here. And I must say you are our first returning guest. I'm not sure how you would want to take that, but if we were not quite so low budget, you know, we would have a couple of confetti guns go off or whatever, <laughs> like the Super Bowl. But, yeah. but unfortunately, I'm sure GRTV staff would not want to clean all that up. <laughs> okay, would you first like to start with the in-map in general? And sure. Go ahead and... Take us through it. <laughs> Not a problem. MAP is the Michigan Medicare Medicaid Assistance Program. Uh, we are a statewide volunteer program, a nonprofit program that provides free and unbiased help answering Medicare questions. Uh, for those people who uh, receive their Medicare and You book, uh, you flip that book over to the back cover and you'll find our 1-800 number. Uh, so anywhere in the state of Michigan, uh, if you call that number, it will be, you'll be directed to your local MAP office uh, to speak with a local counselor uh, to help answer Medicare questions. Uh, we help uh, people everything from understanding what the different parts of Medicare are uh, to evaluating uh, drug plans through Part D, Medicare Advantage plans, identifying uh, Medigap plans, supplement policies, uh, helping to identify which companies sell those and maybe some of the base prices for those. Uh, and then we also help with other assistance programs, uh, Medicaid. Uh, there are certain uh, Medicaid programs that are available for Medicare beneficiaries, uh, plus a prescription assistance program through Social Security called Extra Help. So we help uh, identify people who are qualified for that and help uh, individuals complete the applications uh, on Social Security website for that program. So we help beneficiaries, family members. Uh, we've had social workers from different programs give us a call for uh, clients that they're working with. So anybody who has a question about Medicare uh, our office can help answer those questions. Yeah, it being all these different components are so complex. If you don't do your homework, if you get, you know, like an extra, you know, component on board per se, it could end up doing more harm than good. So you definitely need to do your homework, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yep, and we help people understand what all those different parts are, how they interact. Uh, when people have uh, retiree programs or Medicaid, how does that interact with Medicare? When I go to my doctor, what's going to happen when I go to the pharmacy? So we help provide accurate knowledge uh, on all these different parts uh, so people can make a informed decision on what type of coverage they want for the next year. Yeah, it's better to find out before than after the fact. Mm -hmm. That right. could really compound the situation, I'm sure. Yep. Uh, would you like to do a Medicare overview? Absolutely. Or We'll do, go through and do a quick overview okay. of what Medicare is, uh, especially for people who are coming to us who are turning 65 or after two years of receiving Social Security benefits, your 25th month of Social Security disability, a beneficiary becomes uh, eligible for Medicare. 
Uh, so what? What? Does so that it's mean? not an age criteria, quite so what? Okay. Yeah, the vast majority of people qualify based on age. Oh, uh, okay. But two oh. years of disability, uh, you can become Medicare eligible plus end stage renal, uh, and uh, ALS or automatic qualifiers. Uh, but in Medicare, uh, there are uh, three main parts. Uh, the first part uh, is called Part A. Uh, part A covers hospital inpatient coverage. Uh, so if you are admitted into the hospital as an inpatient, Part A will provide that coverage. Uh, for the vast majority of Medicare beneficiaries, there is no premium for Part A based on either their work history or the work history of a, of a spouse or a parent. Uh, those Social Security taxes we pay when uh, people are working, uh, that is what goes towards Part A. Uh, so once you have enough work credits, uh, Part A has no cost. Uh, Part A also covers uh, hospice benefits, uh, some uh, in-home benefits for recovery from illness uh, or injury, uh, also for uh, rehabilitation services at a, at a nursing home. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about some special aspects of that down the road, but uh, for Part A, if you're admitted into the hospital as inpatient, there will be a deductible that uh, you would be billed from the facility. Uh, that deductible for next year will be uh, $1,365 uh, wow. for the hospital stay. 1364 uh, for that hospital stay. I was a dollar off. Uh, but that's a 2019 rate. So um, so that would cover a 60-day period. And if you're in the hospital longer than 60 days, then uh, uh, providers are allowed to charge a daily copay rate. Uh, so we help, wow. e help explain what those benefits are to people when they come in uh, and sit down and meet with us. I would think the majority of them in that situation would have to go on a monthly payment plan or something. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that's why people would get supplement plans uh, or apply for Medicaid when they start yeah, having. I don't. Yeah, I don't wish to get too far ahead. Here. All right. Yep. <laughs> yep. So that's Part A. Uh, part B is your doctor uh, services. Uh, so going to see the doctor. Uh, lab work and x-rays, uh, durable medical equipment. Uh, if it's not a hospital inpatient stay, it's going to fall under Part B. Uh, Part B, uh, there is a monthly premium that would be automatically deducted out of Social Security benefits. Uh, and that rate this year is $134 per month. Uh, and next year's rate, so 2019, it will be $135.50 per month. Uh, part B, like I mentioned, doctors and labs and x-rays, things of that nature. Uh, there is a yearly deductible for those services of $185. And then after that, uh, Medicare will pay 80% of the Medicare approved amount and the beneficiary can be billed 20% of the Medicare approved amount. Along with those services, uh, again, uh, there's some in-home uh, care services that uh, can be taken care of for those recovering from uh, injury or illness. Um, but that is Part B, uh, pretty straightforward and standard, uh, a deductible and then the, and then the coinsurance uh, for the rest of the year. Uh, along with Part A and B, so that's going to be your primary health coverage, uh, then you could select a, a Part D plan, a prescription plan. Uh, these are for any medications that you take daily that you'd go pick up at your local pharmacy. Uh, currently, in 2018, we have 25 drug plans available here in Michigan. Uh, in 2019, we'll have 29 plans that are available. So, so the more plans to choose from, is that a good or bad thing? Uh, it's both. <laughs> so bad... There's lots of choice that needs to be made, lots of options, and how do you figure out what's going to be best for you? That can be very overwhelming. That's uh, what I was thinking. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, the unique thing about these plans, you know, out of the 29 plans, their premiums all vary, you know, what you have to pay per month. 
2019, the lowest premium is $14.50 per month, and the highest is about $89 per month. So lots of, of, of range on premium costs. Uh, some will include a deductible. Uh, the maximum deductible next year is $415 uh, at the start of the year. But the big difference between all these plans is going to be what their uh, formularies are and what their network is for pharmacies. So they all cover medications differently. Uh, they uh, classify them differently. So with one plan, it could be a lower cost, whereas another plan, a medication could be higher. And then they all work differently at different pharmacies. And so what our volunteers are able to do is utilize the Medicare.gov website. Uh, they have a plan finder tool on there. We enter medications in the pharmacy and it runs that information through all 29 of those plans. And it'll give us an estimated cost for the plan. That way it puts those 29 plans in an order that's really easy to understand. How much do I have to pay? And so then you only have to look at the top two, three, or four plans uh, to see what what the lowest cost will be yeah, and which yeah, one do I want to go with. Yeah, because in the right mind is going to look through 29 different plans. Not me. No, no. I guess the question that comes to my mind is how do they determine to add or subtract these plans? It's all going to be up to the insurance companies. Uh, so we have, uh, I know in 2018, about 12 companies, uh, and most of them have multiple policies that they offer. Okay. Uh, so they are looking to provide a certain amount of coverage at a certain cost, uh, and hopefully one of their plans will, your needs will fit with that plan. And so they will look to see if they can get you to sign up with one of those. But yeah, we run the costs on the Medicare site, and it's uh, an easy way, uh, helps make the decision a little bit easier for people. Yeah, it narrows the scope a little, mm -hmm. so it's not quite so overwhelming. Correct. I only can imagine what it must have been like pre-internet age when there was really not as such a method to narrow down your scope of search. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the nice thing about our program is that uh, we run into many beneficiaries who either don't have a computer, uh, who do not know how to navigate these different websites. We are a resource that can help do that for them. And we don't make decisions for people on which plan to choose. We'll just gather the information and present present it to them, and then the beneficiary can make the decision from there. Uh, but we will help them along the way for that. Yeah, you just provide, you know, accurate, reasonable information. Correct. Without, yeah. you know, being persuasive, per se. Exactly. Yeah, so with uh, Medicare, there are two routes to selecting coverage. And then what I explained with the A, B, and the Part D, that's one route of coverage that you can pick. Uh, along with that route, uh, for some people, they select a supplement plan, a Medigap plan. And that policy will, you pay a monthly premium for that plan, and it'll cover the copays and deductibles of Part A and B. So with the original Medicare, we do see some people that will select a supplement plan. Uh, they like those because they just pay the monthly premium and don't have to worry about co-pays and deductibles when they go see the doctor or go to the hospital. Uh, so that's one route to Medicare coverage. The second route are Medicare Advantage plans, sometimes referred to as Part C. Uh, these Advantage plans combine together Part A, Part B, and Part D coverage into one plan. Uh, so sometimes these uh, Advantage plans are referred to as replacement Medicare plans because they're replacing your Medicare coverage. Uh, you still have to sign up for Part A and Part B of Medicare, so they're still going to take that $135.50 uh, out of your Social Security check each month. But all the coverage goes through the private company. Uh, they have the same basic benefits as Part A and Part B, so the same services that are 
uh, covered in original Medicare would also be covered in the Advantage plans. Uh, is it a fair assumption to say those are usually a bit more costly? Or? Uh, for the Advantage plans, it is a wide range on the monthly premium. Okay. Uh, we have a couple plans here in Kent County that are $0 premium per month for that Advantage plan, and we have some that are over $200 per month for that wow. Advantage plan. So a wide range. Uh, many of these policies are either HMOs or PPOs. Uh, so it's important when you go to sign up for one of these plans that you identify with your providers which policies they accept. Uh, so these, again, with their networks, these plans, you want to make sure to get the, the in-network cost at your provider. So you want to review to see you know, okay, does this company or does it, does my doctor take this company? Do they take that company? How about my hospital? Does my hospital take all the plans or is it just limited to a few of the companies? Yeah, because the last thing I would think you would want to do is pay on a network cost. Correct. Wow. And usually all these plans have some type of out of network coverage. However, they're going to have a much higher deductible and then their copays are going to be much higher. Uh, so when we sit down with somebody, uh, especially those here in Kent County in the Grand Rapids area, uh, one of my first questions is, which hospital do you go to? Because uh, there are a few of the hospitals here in town that only take about nine out of the 25 Advantage plans that are available. So that just makes it that much easier process to begin with. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yep, you automatically, just by that one question, you can knock off two-thirds of the plans that are available. So, and they don't say use the KISS method for nothing. <laughs> Keep it <laughs> yeah. simple, stupid. Yep. <laughs> yeah, especially, as I mentioned, we have 25 of these Advantage plans, and they have all their own copays and deductibles for uh, hospital and medical services. They have their own you know, lists of that they cover for medications. Well, whatever you can do to keep it simple and eliminate half those plans, you do that from the get-go. And again, when we sit down with somebody, after we do that, then we look at what's important to that person uh, if they want an Advantage plan. You know, what's, what do these plans look like for their prescription coverage? How much of a monthly premium do you want to pay? What type of deductible do you want to pay? And then your co-pays. Uh, the nice thing about these plans, they do have a max out of pocket for uh, for services. So once you've paid a certain amount uh, in copays and deductibles, then the plan will start paying 100% of those costs for the rest of that year. I guess would this be a method of minimizing price gouging or something along those lines? Yeah, it's a way to protect beneficiaries from uh, uh, paying a lot for their medical services. Original Medicare does not have a max out of pocket. So that's one of the nice benefits uh, for the Advantage plans is, hey, you know, once if I go to the hospital a few times, once I reach my max and I know I won't have to pay anymore, so I won't have these extraordinarily expensive bills. Yeah, and of course, as we all know, Depending on how long you stay in the hospital, uh, it can become quite costly. Correct. With these Advantage plans, uh, many of them offer uh, what uh, Medicare calls supplemental benefits for these plans. Uh, so they'll offer some dental, some vision, some hearing benefits, uh, whereas Original Medicare does not provide any coverage in those areas. No. Uh, so, yeah, some people will say, hey, we're looking for uh, some type of dental coverage in addition to our Medicare. Well, that's what I'm doing through my employer. Mm -hmm. I pay, you know, just for the dental and optical. Yep. Yeah. Uh, with these Advantage plans, uh, it's probably pretty similar to a, an employer plan. Uh, where they have some of these coverages tied in. So, for example, uh, with some of the plans, they'll include uh, some dental checkups and cleanings and maybe a set of x-rays. Uh, but that could be it 
that's included in the plan. Uh, these Advantage plans can also offer rider policies where you pay an additional 20 or $30 per month and have another $1,000 worth of coverage for dental services. But again, there's limits to that. There's only certain uh, services, certain dental work that they might provide the coverage for. And then they're usually going to have a cap. Uh, most of the plans, it's about $1,000 uh, for the year. So once you reach that max, uh, then you're on your own for the out of, out of your own pocket for the rest of the year. Uh, yeah, that, I'm sure that could be quite challenging to decide what to pick because we don't always know what's going to happen to our own know, teeth and so forth. <laughs> correct. That's like uh, for our health too. On the health yeah. side, you know, which one of these policies do I want to select? I don't know what my health is going to be like next year, so it's insurance. There's going to be some type of gamble that's involved, but what you want to do is prepare yourself and protect yourself by picking the plan that's going to uh, limit those uh, those costs to you. So. Okay. Um, I think we covered them all, did we? That is a, a pretty uh, solid overview. And then when people come and meet with me, I'll have a chart because I'm a picture guy. So I have a diagram that show all these. And then as we go into more detail on all the parts, we can reference that chart. So uh, I always encourage people who are first starting Medicare. Um, I can tell you this information over the phone, but it makes more sense when they uh, come in to meet with me. Uh, where I have all my material that can help uh, help people better understand this information. Uh, when I started with MAP, I couldn't tell you the difference between Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, so lots of these resources that I give out were resources that were helpful for me in learning all these uh, all these different uh, programs uh, that were offered. So I'm figuring if it worked for me, it should help some other people too. So yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. and I guess before we go, we certainly want to remind them the enrollment period ends, what, next month on the 7th, I believe? Correct, yeah. The, uh, the drug plans and the advantage plans, they change their coverage each year. They change their pharmacy networks, they change their coverage, uh, they change what medications they cover. Uh, so from October 15, to December 7 each year is the open enrollment period. Uh, that way you can review your coverage for next year, uh, make sure that the new plans that are available or if you want to stick with the current one that it's still going to work for you next year. And if it's not, now is the time to change. Uh, and again that ends December 7. Uh, so since we're quickly approaching the end of that, uh, people need to to get going on, on reviewing those plans because if you don't have a, a special enrollment uh, purpose uh, for next year, for example, if you uh, move or if you um, have extra help, uh, you might be able to change plans then. But if you don't have one of those, you're, you're essentially locked into your plan for the year. Uh, so fall open enrollment's the time to make that change. Yeah, yeah, unless you're lucky like I am be and being dual Medicare Medicaid that I guess under that criteria you're allowed to change any time I guess. Correct. Yeah, there's gonna be a slight tweak to that next year. Uh oh. <laughs> so this will be good info for you too. Uh so people who qualify for uh Medicaid, uh they also qualify for uh, a program called Extra Help. Uh, so that program through Social Security helps to reduce uh, prescription premiums, co-pays, and deductibles. Uh, but one of the other benefits to that program is it provides an ongoing special enrollment. So you can change plans at any time. Well, at least that's how it is right now. Starting next year, you can change plans, but you can only make one plan change per quarter. Oh. So from January through March, you can make one plan change, and then depending on which month you make that change in, uh, the new policy will go into effect the first of the next month. If you need to change plans again, you have to wait till the second quarter. 
So that's going to be what April through June. April, May, June. Yeah, April through June. And then once again, July through the end of September. And then if you enroll, uh, make a plan change in October through December, that new plan won't start until the first of the year. Uh, so there is some delay on that uh, enrollment change in the in the fourth quarter. So, yeah, yeah, I'm assuming this was probably implemented because there were probably evidently several folks that <laughs> changed uh, plans that frequently, which I find kind of hard to. <laughs> believe I suppose. <laughs> yep, we will find uh, some people who change their plans pretty frequently. Um, and this should uh, put the brakes on that a little bit, but people still will have a have a chance to change plans. Yeah. Uh, one of the areas of concern was with uh, uh, op opioid addiction. Uh, we were finding that people were changing their plans frequently uh, they were changing uh, the doctors that they were going to, and they were changing uh, which pharmacies that they would go to for these medications. Uh, well, now Medicare is starting to address that issue by putting some limits on that. Uh, so if uh, Medicare identifies people who are uh, using uh, different pharmacies to pick up these opioid medications, uh, Medicare can put a lock on, on that to where you can only get that prescription uh, by one doctor and then at one pharmacy. Uh, there are some appeals that can be made for uh, certain uh, situations and there are some people, uh, for example, in hospice, uh, this rule does not apply to them, but uh, Medicare is trying to address uh, the op opioid addiction issue going on in our country. So It makes much more sense now because mm -hmm. before you mentioned this, the only uh, time I would change is if my particular prescription was no longer on that plan's formulary list. Mm -hmm. yep. I would think that would be the most logical reason why you would want to change. Correct. And that's, again, that's what we see most people, why they need to switch plans to. So. Uh, that's, I'm sure, still going to be the main reason moving forward why people will contact us. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, as we start to wrap up, is there anything else you going to tell our audience besides do their diligence, if you will? <laughs> uh, the only other main thing uh, that I do want to point out is the new Medicare cards. Uh, have started to go out here oh, in the state I, of Michigan. I just got mine. All right, very good. I was so glad to get rid of that old beat up, tethered thing that looked like it was from Civil War almost. Oh yeah, the uh, yeah the Medicare cards. They had the uh, they used to utilize a beneficiary social security number uh, for uh, their Medicare claim number. Uh, the problem with that is if there is fraud or abuse that occurs, uh, you can't cancel that number. So people were able to commit fraud and then continue and continue on multiple oh times. Oh my goodness. Uh, so with this new Medicare number, they are eliminating Social Security numbers from the Medicare card and are assigning a random, uh, non-intelligent, alphanumeric number. So it's going to be 11 either numbers or letters mixed together uh, randomly selected. Uh, so that'll be your new Medicare card. Oh, kind of like some of these websites do the pre-generate passwords for us. Correct. Which we can never memorize. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Yep. And so, yep, these cards are going out to everybody. Uh, you can uh, destroy your old card and start using these new cards immediately. Yeah. And the nice thing about these new numbers, if you suspect fraud or abuse that occurred uh, based on your Medicare number, you can contact Medicare or Social Security, and they will uh, cancel that number out and send you a whole new card with a whole new number uh, okay. on it. So. Yeah, be it's pre-generated. Correct. Yep. 
So okay. I got a couple situations here locally uh, where people have been taken advantage of uh, by this back brace and arm brace scam that's going on. Uh, there's also a, a pain cream scam that's going on right now. Uh, you know, one of my beneficiaries that I've been helping, uh, Medicare and Medicaid have been billed over $7,500 for uh, these arm and back braces that uh, this person does not need. Uh, but Medicare has paid for it, and uh, hopefully they're reviewing the case that we submitted to try and get those dollars back because it was fraud. This is things that she did not want, and uh, uh, they keep sending it to her. So uh, if we had this new number, uh, this new card at the beginning when this first happened, we could have had this stopped at that time immediately before this happened. So this is a prime example why it was implemented. Correct, yep. $65 billion a year wow. lost to Medicare fraud. Well, I guess the obvious question there is why they didn't implement it sooner at that, that high of a cost. Wow. Yeah, they've... Uh, it's it's an expensive process for sending out all these new cards and systems had to be updated. So we were waiting for uh, um, our federal government to uh, uh, set monies aside to be able to do this, and they finally have okay. done that. So, yeah, I'm sure they were glad of that at that high of a cost due to fraudulent reasons. They'll make their money back with these new protections. So, yeah. Uh, limit these scammers that are out there stealing from all of us from beneficiaries and people paying into the system and uh, society in general so yeah and I just want to say the last time I went to my primary I thought they would want a copy of my new card but they did not request it I thought that was kind of weird yeah, you know, uh, Medicare suggests you still do not carry your card with you on a daily basis. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a way to protect you from uh, fraud and yeah. abuse, but take it with you for your first few doctor visits. Yeah, there are some providers that will make copies of it or, or write that information down, but I'm sure there are some there that could have uh, protection uh, protections put in place so they don't okay. make those copies and just require you to bring it. Okay, yeah. Well, I'm surprised they didn't want to see it being, it's new and all that, those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up. Uh, this is uh, Scott in the system, and I'll be seeing you soon in April. Thank you so much. Have a good day.